think it says we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel, whose name is changed to David Guillo ODC. And there's a reason for that. Up until now, it was the Days Post Apocalyptic World or the Origin of Life. And I think we're ready now to go full bore on what this channel is supposed to be all about. And that is ODC. Optimally Dissipative Configuration. I've even got a special graphic for us. A subject of which I wrote a book about called The Symphony of Entropy, The Unveiling of Optimally Dissipative Configuration. And today's topic is randomness. And is it random, really? And it isn't. Randomness is not random. And that's the topic for today's video. So we're live right now, which means that if there's anybody else, anybody out there watching, please, um, if you'd like, make yourself be known. And if you have any questions, I will even answer them. So now I'm setting up the system for us to walk around. And of course, you might know our special physics cat mascot, Nebula. She, she gets so excited when I get started, when I get set up for this. And so, Today's main topic is randomness and how I'm saying that it isn't random at all. And so to get started, maybe we'll go over to the fire pit. And we've got Kitty the pet saying hello, good luck on the stream today, thank you. And let's move ahead to the fire pit. I think that's where Nebula wants to go too. It's nice and warm here, okay. Hi everybody. Yeah, feel free to say hello or uh, ask questions. Anything that's topic related or to the channel, I'll be happy to go over. And I'm really excited about this whole concept of ODC and how it answers for the first time in a satisfactory way, how and why we are here. What is the origin of life? And are we alone? And to get started, why don't we talk about where we got this idea from? So ever since I was a child, I would wonder how is it that, for example, that there should be life on one planet and not another one? And the answers we usually get is based on our belief systems and belief and religions. And, and it's kind of odd to me that, for example, we kind of know that there's billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies out there and that there might be just as many planets as there are galaxies and all that stuff. And yet, when we talk about physics, we're happy to, to see that, for example, stars come out of nebulae, nurseries. So they're almost like give birth to stars, almost like a living thing, if you will. And, oh, she likes to fire. Yeah, she likes to fire. And then we, we acknowledge, we're happy that there's galaxies, billions of them, each one of them having hundreds of millions of stars in them and other planets and we're fine with that. And then we come to planet Earth and we, we start talking about life and what is life and what is the origin of us. And if I had a sound effect for a, a record scratching, everything stops there. It's like, whoa, whoa, if we're gonna talk about like humans and life, then somehow we can't go ahead and talk about normal physics. Somehow we break the mold. Somehow us being here isn't as normal as everything else. And that part for me is, is kind of odd. It, see, it seems very maybe self-centered. It seems quite, um, it's not satisfactory to me to say that everything in the universe is, is fine. It's all physical. We can kind of mesh it out and figure it out. But when it comes to life, somehow something else needs to be added. And today we actually have real answers as to how and why we're here. And the point of it all, and she loves this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So she doesn't want to get up. So let's see if I can do anything from the fire pit. Let's, let's see if I can show a few things. So by the way, there's hundreds of different systems to make this whole presentation possible. A lot of moving parts. So even if there's nobody watching here and not too many people, at least I'm able to practice, practice my delivery for my future, let's say, TED Talk or Netflix special. And getting all my thoughts together in a live way really makes a, is good practice for somebody. So when I made mistakes in the previous videos, I think about it all week and how I can make it better. And hopefully the systems get better each time. 
And by the way, this type of relationship between, let's say, the intelligence of the universe and the intelligence of humans or living things, there seems to be a separation. Like, we understand that we're smart, we invent things, we, we build these amazing societies, and how does that relate to the intelligence of the universe creating stars? And with ODC, we actually have real physical answers that kind of bind our intelligence and the intelligence of the universe in a way that I call it a universal concept or a unifying theory based on a lot of physical work, physics work that previous people have done. So what I'm saying today is my own um, presentation and interpretation, and I'm taking it to a new level with the optimally dissipative configuration um, as a way to kind of illustrate and show people how and why we're here and are we alone. So let's go to, so I'm still in this old abandoned building and you might have seen behind me, there's a big dinosaur and I show on my channel how I built it actually. There's a bunch of videos and I'll show that like that. And so one of the main, I think maybe I'll have music in the background next time. Next time you see me, I'll have music in the background or maybe some thunder and lightning, that'd be fun. So here we're building a dinosaur uh, parts, putting it together vertebrae by vertebrae. It's made of, from about 120, no, about 1200 separate pieces that were 3D printed and 120 pieces Galileo put together. Galileo was a mathematician. So that's, that's a mistake. Let's not go to Galileo quite yet. Let's go ahead, however, go to... So this is um, Jeremy England. He's the physicist. I call him the Michael Jordan of, our, of this channel because it's from him that I learned. He's actually a real life physicist that came up with the fact that life is actually here and is as unsurprising as a, as a bunch of rocks rolling downhill. And that actually fascinates me because what do we mean by that? And let's go ahead and go to, nobody's requesting anything, so we'll go to the wall. Okay, kitty, sorry. I'm gonna get up now. Yeah, we'll be back. Yeah, okay. We're going to go to the wall. And this is the illustration that we'll find on our book, The Symphony of Entropy, available at Amazon, that I wrote about the concept of OBC, Optimally Dissipative Configuration. So our drawing here illustrates, here's the Big Bang. And when I get back here, I'm gonna pause this camera right here. This is the Big Bang, and everything goes from order to disorder. So that's what these dots signify here. So this Big Bang over trillions and trillions of years goes from order to disorder. And this formula here is just a generic formula on the fact that entropy always, always increases. However, on the way there, on the way to nothingness, that the process of order to disorder is not random. So that's one of the big revelations that I have for us is that as we know from the Big Bang, we get things like galaxies and nebulae and solar systems. And then from solar systems, we get planets and eventually we get some DNA and dinosaurs in life. So is that a coincidence? Is that a random thing? Is that divine intervention? And so today we have real physical answers to answer those questions. And, and this is what this is all about. So to talk about how randomization is not random. So let's say we want to bet on something that's going to be 50-50 or who's gonna start the football or soccer game, we flip a coin. And the idea is that it's a randomization. We don't know what it's going to end on and we don't know, or if we, let's say, roll some dice, we, it's, there should be an equal chance that they all um, should come in the same number. 
However, if we maybe start going backwards a little bit, we will realize that actually there's not that much to I go frame by frame. You see how if we, were, if we were able to slow the coin down and slow down the process, and if we knew every bit of information about how fast the, the coin was flipped, about what the, what the angle is off the thumb, if we had every bit of information, or if we were to, say, play it backwards, we would see that, oh yeah, obviously you landed on that side because because under those conditions, it couldn't have gone any other way. And so that's the same thing with, let's say, if, that's the same thing with actually everything in the universe. So the reason it landed on heads or tails is, is random from our perspective because we can't compute all of the parameters that would require the, the, the coin to, to, to land on one side or the other. And that's why to us it's random, but if we were able to slow it down or have all of the information available, then it's not random at all. In fact, the coin is doing exactly what it's supposed to do based on the parameters and conditions that it is under, and then it falls on whichever side those, those ended up. And so that's an analogy to, to life. And we're gonna come back now to the wall zone. And we're going to make this contraption work. So similarly, on this is the atomizer. And what this does is it's got all of these different ping pong balls. Some of them have magnets on them, some of them don't. You see this contraption here is supposed to simulate like a living thing, but we'll get to that later. It's not completely finished. We also have a mouse trap there. And if the conditions were right, you see that stick there. If, if one of the balls was able to make it there, it would let um, activate the mouse trap in such a way that it would never be able to come back to where it is because it's the optimally dissipative configuration that if it does get set off, it would take a lot of work to, to reset it. And so that's the forward motion of time in the universe is that the optimally dissipative configuration is the one that prevails. And this is a theme that we'll find across anything that we do from what Netflix show we're gonna watch tonight to your commute to work, to the layout of your kitchen, to the origin of life, to everything we've talked about on this board. Molecules, atoms, humans, they always do behave evolve in the way that's optimally dissipative. And this is where Jeremy England was, was the, the first person that I know of who actually kind of talked about dissipative adaptation as being the way that things end up going, but they do so every second of, of time for trillions of years. And so this is where we come from. So when I turn this on, I'm going to turn off my, my microphone and right now they're all kind of separated, we see. And when we're done, it's gonna be a unique configuration and it's one that's optimally dissipative. And so let's see where we are after we are done with that. Yeah, I think that worked. All right, so what we've done now, see, it doesn't look like the way it looked before. And in fact, we've got quite a few things happening here, including, the, you know, I let off the, the mouse trap, and the, eventually I'll build this so that when the mouse trap goes off, other things happen as well. But for now, we see that it's activated and it's, it's never ever on its own going to come back from there. It, a lot of work would have to be done, but the optimally dissipative configuration, 
if there was a configuration of the atoms that made it possible for that reaction to take place over a long period of time, it would, and that would be the final configuration. And that's the difference between something happening over time and something not happening over time. It is the forward move, movement of time is the optimally dissipative configuration. We've also got some other interesting pieces here. That one wasn't so interesting, but we've got kind of like a cluster over here. And see this configuration here will never ever happen again. And so it's unique, but it's also very normal because that's the optimally dissipative configuration. So we, when we think of, of us being special and unique, we are, and we're never gonna be able to be reproduced again in the same way, but it's also, it also wasn't random because it couldn't have been any other way. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to continue with my spiel by going to, let's say, to the board. How about that? And I'm watching my levels. Let me know also if there's any skipping in the microphone that can happen sometimes. What about quantum intermittency? Is that random? So Kitty the pet like to know, what about quantum intermittency? Awesome question, thank you. The answer to that is that I'm not sure exactly what quantum interdominancy is. However, I'd like to point out that what I'm talking about is, uh, goes as far as the molecular level and atoms and what we can predict and deduce and from that. And I understand that when we go to the quantum level, things are that much more at that level, things are less known or predictable. However, the emergence of the atoms that they're a part of are predictable to the, to the tune of ODC, optimally dissipative configuration. Root word, determine, awesome. And so that's the answer to that. So similarly, I can't go beyond this universe when I talk about the, how far we can take ODC, optimally dissipative configuration, because um, while it'd be silly to think that our universe is the only one, and I say that that would be silly because any time in the past where we thought we were, as far as we can see is as far as it goes, whether it's the ocean or the flatness of the horizon making the earth flat, or obviously if we only see, if we see the sun going over the, the earth, that, that means it's spinning around the earth. So from our perspective, things, we only go as far as we can see. And there's no reason, and similarly, solar system, now we find out there's many solar systems within our galaxy from all the different stars, and then we find out there's billions of other galaxies. And so there's no reason to think that because we can't see farther than our universe currently, that that should be the only one. So that's the default setting according to our ODC thing here. But thanks to you for um, interacting, Kitty the Pet. I appreciate that. Again, oh, I've been also asked, like, how do I get, how do I stay so happy and motivated about this channel or this topic when there's not that many people tuning in or seemingly care about it? And I love it. I feel like we're, we're, we've, we're, we're, we're on a gold mine here. We've got answers to so many great, important things. And Years from now, we would look back at these videos that nobody's watching and see this is the, the origin of us coming to a whole new dawn of understanding about ourselves, about the universe, about how and why we're here, and are we alone? And th with ODC, we have real answers to that. So maybe I'll explain some of these things that we see on the board here, if there aren't any more questions or comments, and because it is my pleasure. So, um, in this book, The Symphony of Entropy, Unveiling the Optimally Dissipative Configuration, in the preface, I talk about what is like a thought experiment or what is the, the genesis of this whole ODC or, or problem with humans and human intelligence and the intelligence of the universe and how does it relate back to, can we somehow combine those or is it true that for life or humans to be here, something else needs to be introduced? 
the laws of physics aren't enough, so we need to have some kind of a divine intervention or one of the gods to help us. And so, so it's, it's a classic riddle where we say that, okay, a, a Boeing 747 is made of million parts intricately working together to make a working airliner. And so people might say, okay, if you were to take apart, take apart the entire airliner, scatter the parts over a field, have a tornado run through it, what are the odds that you'll have a working airliner at the end of that experiment? And I think everyone can say, there's zero chance that that's ever gonna happen, unless we lived in an infinite world where by definition it would happen, but that's not the case. So in the case of an airliner, a human had to put it together. And we see where we're going with this. So a human had to have the intelligence to create the airliner. So the next obvious subsequent question is, what then created the human or us or life? And this is where we have a question mark here. And this is where we would say, well, we, it's gotta be a God or an intervention of some sort because based on that analogy. But if we're able to kind of zoom out the camera and see and describe, our, describe ourselves and the airliner, not so much as those definitions we just gave them, but more so as optimally dissipative configurations, thank you, then at that point we see that the only reason the airliner that humans went through so much trouble to build the airliner and to design it and to have it evolve from other airplanes is because it serves the human. It serves the human survival, reproduction, and production of entropy. And that's the big key there. That's the big, how is life like a bunch of rocks rolling down a hill that we just heard from Jeremy England. And, and that's the key. And the reason humans are here is because or life in general is because that was the best configuration to release a lot of potential energy that was on the planet. So that's what these two, these two spheres are here for. This is a planet that does not have life on it, but it does have, let's say, an atmosphere and the sun is beating down on that planet. And so there's, if somebody could, something could release that energy that the earth, that's that's present in that planet, it would. And over time on our planet, it did. After a few hundred million years, we get this thing called LUCA, our uh, last universal common ancestor, LUCA. I'll add a graphic when I do the post editing. But it turns out that us or living things on that same planet is optimally dissipative, <laughs> optimally dissipative releasing a lot of that energy, hence having that downward motion of the why it's so obvious that life, sh life or some complex optimally dissipative configuration should be here because it had somewhere to go. The release of that potential energy when it does happen is more irreversible than that not happening. Therefore, it is the final outcome and on and on and on for trillions of years for every atom in, of a molecule ever that existed. Still no answer, so I do have more to say. I did mention a, a TED talk or a special Netflix special, or I'll take Hulu or Amazon, that's fine too. And today we're gonna talk about the tenets of ODC. So tenets would be rules, ground, ground rules of, if we're gonna talk about ODC, things that we need to understand or need things, old ideas that we need to set aside. And I'll relate them to our first two laws of thermodynamics. The first one is that we can't create or destroy anything, any energy or things only get converted. So from the Big Bang to billions of years into the future, nothing got destroyed, only converted and nothing got created either. The second law of thermodynamics is that of entropy or S, that everything goes from order to disorder that we saw over there. And what's new about ODC is that we're gonna show that with the, as things go from order to disorder, and this is the theme of today's video, is that it is not random how things go from order to disorder. 
how the Big Bang goes from galaxies and nebulae to planets to, to living things is not random. And we, we don't need to um, add something else to us for us to be here. And this is what's brand new and that's gonna t be difficult to, to enter into the mainstream, but super important because I know it gives me a whole different outlook on everything in the universe. So everything on, on this table did not get here by accident. Somehow it was important enough for a human, for their survival, for whether they're inventing or selling something, to for their own survival. That's why it's all here. And we need to be able to see all of life and everything else that happens on that same level. The fact that Earth has life rather than not serves the overall increase in entropy. And that's hard to imagine. And so the, the fact that randomness is not random is the second tenet of ODC, optimally dissipative configuration. And so it relates to the number two over here. And this is why I have this formula here that entropy plus ODC equals us. So entropy is the, is the force, it's the power engine that goes from order to disorder. It's, it's, what, it's what we can I, all kind of intuitively relate to if we, let's say, drop some dye in a glass of water and we kind of know that it's eventually going to dissipate and give you a uniformly colored glass. And that's what entropy is. You might have also heard that it's a, if you don't clean up your room, it's gonna get messy just naturally because it takes a lot of work to keep things ordered. So the second part of this formula is now with ODC, we have that same entropy with, but with both direction and structure because since it's not random, everything is going from Everything at every moment is going from one optimally dissipative configuration to the next. So that's the second tenet, is that randomness is not random. The first one, and probably the most controversial at all, and the hardest to talk about. So remember that the first law of thermodynamics says that we can't create or destroy anything. And I just came up with this in meditation before doing this video. The first tenet of the concept of ODC What are you doing here? She, she likes to be helpful. So the first tenet of ODC is that, at least for the time being, when we're talking about science or looking for truth, we need to try to leave our stories or belief systems behind, just for, just for now. We need to understand that when humans very naturally come up with belief systems and stories, when, whenever we don't know something, by definition, we're gonna come up something with something in our brain that makes sense, whether it's, oh wow, this, this sun up in the sky has a lot to do with whether we're gonna live or die and whether our crops are going to go well or not. So we invent a, a god of the sun, very natural. And then we, we kind of see correlations between, oh, we had a good harvest this year and, and we also did this or didn't do that. And so that becomes part of the culture, part of the belief system that, and it makes sense. And that's, that's how it goes. However, science always catches up to the old beliefs to the point where, and we're, we'll talk about Galileo in a little bit, where the, when the science catches up with the belief system, there's, there's always some kind of a clash or a difficult period of time where we have to eventually accept the truth of the science and somehow modify or have our belief system evolve. And that always happens. So this is the first tenet of ODC, optimally dissipative configuration, that we need to leave our belief systems and stories and understand that every human on the planet has a different belief system and a different interpretation of what God might be. Therefore, it is subjective rather than objective. And in science, we're seeking for the truth. We're looking for a formula or a concept that would work in a different galaxy as well. So if aliens either looked at our ways of life or if we looked at an alien's way of life, whatever we're coming up with here in ODC should have to apply, be able to apply to both. However, if those aliens have a belief system, just like humans have belief systems, which change over time in different cultures, those would not be absolute in both galaxies. So hopefully that's 
an analogy that we can not, not to diff, accept with not too much difficulty. So we're on a roll here. So let's have some fun and maybe go to the, about the holodeck. That would be fun. Hope we can hear me and all that. This is one of my favorite things. And hey, there we are. And so we talked about the, let's say if we were to drop some dye in, in a beaker, already we see some, I, I, I think there are amazing structures appearing already. So even though it seems random and that configuration that will never exist again, it's unique and yet it's perfectly normal. And if we knew the exact, all of the information and the, the previous configuration, like if I go one, one frame back, we would know that the next frame is going to be what it is. So there's no surprise there. And I should have brought it up before, but then we have chaos theory, which delves into the fact that because it's, we can't predict what eight frames from this will look like exactly because like Kitty the Pet talked about, we have um, on the quantum level, we can't really predict exactly where each molecule is gonna go. And then wherever that molecule goes will determine the next step that it goes. And so we, we can't predict exactly what the configuration will be a few frames from now. And yet it's perfectly normal. It'll never happen again. And that's how we need to think about what life is and how unique we are on this planet. That's one of trillions and gajillion planets in the universe that if we think about what life might look like on a different planet, we need to get away from the fact that it's gotta be biological or DNA or carbon based because those things are very specific structures that if they occurred here for the first time, as opposed to let's say pans, panspermia, we will, I talked about that in a, in a previous video, but if DNA evolved here, then it needs to be as unique as what we saw over there at the atomizer and also as unique as this little structure that we see right here in front of me. And the only reason that DNA or this little structure here could have been brought like that would be if the previous conditions were exactly like that. And that's why, according to ODC, we, we, our definition of life is very specific and human centered. And so the term ODC, optimally dissipative configuration, is the way to think about, which by the way is why I renamed the channel. So I put my name, David Gio, comma, as if it's like a, a title or a degree, ODC. I am an optimally dissipative configuration. And according to ODC, everything around us on any scale is an optimally dissipative configuration. But let's see if we have some other fun things here. I love how a hurricane could almost be seen as say a, a form of life. It's got, it reproduces itself. It's got this, this, this amazing structure and we can produce these by having different hot and cold conditions. And so when I think about what life, quote unquote, life could be, I think about, well, what other complex structures exist in other planets, which the, the structure that we see here is the result of the fact that all of the energy that's trying to move from order to disorder, this is the configuration that does that the best. And we're already 35 minutes in, so that's amazing. We're almost done here, but I had some more amazing things for us. Um, so, okay, so in the same way, I've got a bunch of balls coming out of a tube here. And see, that looks very complex and random, but if we were able to look at this one frame at a time, we would see that there's no accidents, there's no, there's no ball going from where it is now to the next, like going through space or time. It, it did exactly what it's supposed to do. 
and hopefully that's what I'm trying to convey. It's kind of like a thought experiment for people to think about when very complex and apparent randomness occurs that it's actually quite orderly and logical, even though it seems just out of the realm of, of so here's another neat little one with the more balls that, so this could be like a, a cold front and a, a warm front getting together, just smashing together. But if we zoom out a little bit, you see those kind of like in waves moving around and forming their own structures, much like a hurricane. We all know the, the example of a, a pool table, for example, ugh, where it seems random, but if we play it kind of slowly, we can see that nothing is not happening the way it's supposed to. And then for a fun example, if you like candies, similarly, you've got a thousand pieces of candies here seemingly doing some crazy configurations, but if we were able to move it one frame at a time, you can see that each little piece is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Even though it seems very random to us, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do in an ODC manner, transferring that potential energy of falling onto the earth and other ones um, dissipating in that sense. All right, back to this one. And we did talk about, <laughs> hi, hello. You wanna see how Sean Carroll talks about the origin Energy of life? Energy transforms from useful that. to useless in the cause of keeping organisms like us alive. In fact, life itself may have arisen because of entropy. The early Earth had pockets of low entropy conditions full of useful energy, like warm alkaline vents on the ocean floor. But there may have been no simple chemical reaction that could take advantage of that energy, use up its usefulness, and allow the entropy to increase. There were, however, more complicated chains of reactions that could do the job. In just the right circumstances, an appropriate network of chemical reactions might find a way to sustain... So here we're talking about how we, we did actually find the er earliest living organisms in the bottom of the ocean in these uh, vents that are very famous. And the idea there is, is that we've got all this potential energy coming out of these vents and yet no simple solution on how to release some of that energy. And what Sean Carroll is very eloquently doing here is showing us that, aha, yes, but we've got all of these molecules running around going crazy in apparent randomness but if, if one of them, like a key, could unlock that potential energy, that, con that configuration and that reaction would be more irreversible, in other words, in the forward moving motion, than, if, than all of the other configurations that didn't create that reaction. And this is where we get the forward moving motion and the intelligence of the universe. Of course, this is happening over millions of years itself by tapping into the useful energy in its environment. Some networks might have become embedded in molecular membranes, the precursors of cell walls, and broken away from their point of origin, becoming the first living organisms. Maybe that's how life began, a complex combination of chemical reactions that figured out how to tap into otherwise unavailable useful energy. Story about why stars shine. Hydrogen nuclei have a ton of useful, low-entropy nuclear energy to release if you can get them to fuse together into helium. But there's a big barrier to getting that to happen. Fusion is hard. And yet, the cores of stars do the job marvelously. So stars, like life, also survive because of the increase of entropy throughout the universe. Our sun takes a low-entropy fuel source, hydrogen nuclei, and converts it into higher-entropy energy, photons of visible light. Life takes that higher entropy energy as a fuel source and converts it into even higher entropy energy, photons of infrared light. In a very real sense, the purpose of life is to continue the mission of the stars. I think that's, that's wonderful. And I recommend it, Sean Carroll on YouTube. You can look it up, Entropy in Life. And it, it changed my life to see where we could have the fact that life is not going against the flow of the universe, but actually with it, it also explains, um, inadvertently, it explains why we go to wars, why cultures exist. All has to do with the ODC, that optimally dissipative configuration. 
One more analogy I like to do is ever since I was young, let's say I moved to this country and it was by airplane and I, I could see a city at night and see all the little cars moving one way and in a different and the other way. And even at a young age, I was mesmerized as, at how this whole, the city itself seems to be alive, but also it seems to be alive very similarly to, because I was also, I had um, aquarium fish and I would put them under the microscope and under the microscope of the tail of the fish, we would see something very similar in the blood vessels that, that are carrying nutrients to and from the different parts and see how that looks like traffic. And so I'm wondering how that intelligence relates back to the intelligence of humans versus the intelligence of nature and what is the common theme with all of this and we find it in ODC optimally dissipative configuration. Thank you. Okay, that was good. So if there's no more questions, I think I'll do maybe a little closeout in the mezzanine. Talk about Galileo for a second. Maybe the cat will join us. So why do I talk about Galileo in almost every video? And the reason is that the concepts that I introduced to you today might be a little bit controversial, saying that um, nothing extra is needed for us to be here, that th the laws of the universe, as wonderful and beautiful as they are, all the, the trillions of things happening at any second, making this moment that you see right here unique, it will never ha ever happen again, is where we are today versus um, coming to understanding that there's planets and galaxies and we're fine with all that, but when we start talking about life or our purpose or how and why we're here and are we alone, then somehow we don't feel okay with, with going along with the, the natural laws of the world. And so this is why this is kind of new. And it's kind of like a few hundred years ago when Galileo came along, Galileo and others who had a telescope would, would realize for sure that we are not indeed the center of the universe. And I just broke it. And, and that we're actually, our Earth is actually one planet of many that's going around the sun. And so that was just pandemonium for the belief systems of the time. And it took about a couple of hundred years for, for the belief systems to catch up with whatever it was that the science was saying. And so that's why I don't mind being alone in this room by myself as I record this, because this is where the human science and thinking is going. And so I, 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 get, I find solace in being able to be one of the first to introduce it to the world. Let me know what you think about that, if you would. And so yeah, let's close it out. We'll go to the desk. I have one last view. So this is a dinosaur I built with these um, 3D printers. I did that because the museums were closed during the pandemic and I thought it'd be a really neat project to try to do. Okay. Let's see if we're still recording, everything's still working. That's great, I'm very happy about this video. Don't worry if you didn't see the first. What I'll do each week, because I'm doing this show every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. And then the next day I'll like edit it down, maybe add some music for, for a separate video that I'll post. And then also take some snippets out of it for maybe some shorts or some little cat videos. Thank you for joining me. I do appreciate it. I love doing this. Um, hopefully you can have some questions below and I will continue to introduce to you the optimally dissipative configuration so long and good night.